You know, uh, <clears throat> we live in a world that's different than it used to be. And that's not a amen. That's not a Lord, let it be so. I mean, in the Hebrew means, Lord, let it be so. That's a oh me. Uh, we live in a, a world that's getting more and more loose, if you will. It seems every year the boundaries around us get wider and wider, looser and looser. Society is much more permissive today than it was 31 years ago or 30 years ago that Leanne and I came here and started pastoring Thompson Station Church. It's, a, it's difficult today to get anybody to make definitive statements. Everybody wants to be elusive. We live in a world of almost total tolerance in one area in some ways and then in, in, lack of tolerance in another, but that's another story. We live in a world that wants to have relativism. In other words, very few people have enough courage to observe some perverted or deviant behavior and then plainly state that according to the Word, the Word of the living God, it's wrong. Our sultry and sensuous culture has very few guidelines and even fewer rules to live by. We almost live in a world that says anything goes. Friends, anything doesn't go for those of us who follow Jesus Christ. We've got one word. It is our guide for life. Where my actions, my attitudes, my beliefs, or my behaviors differ from God's word, I need to change and line up with the word. As believers, followers of Jesus, we know that, that we're not to live like this world. By the presence of God in us, the Holy Spirit, we know in our knower the difference in living of the world and in the world. We got to be in it, but we don't have to be of it. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, we want some boundaries. We want some guidelines along our journey called life. We need it to help us discern right from wrong and help us stay on track. Thankfully, we have guidelines. We don't have to make up subjectively our own guidelines. We have the Word of God. That's been our series for the last three weeks, the Word. Today's message, the Word guides our Christian con conduct. The Word guides our Christian conduct. How are we going to live? Live by the Word. And I just wanted to get really practical today as we finish our series in the Word. We do better when we have boundaries. And the Word, the Bible, God's Word gives us those boundaries. Rules for Christian conduct may be determined in one of two ways. Either by general principles laid down in Scripture, the Word of God, or by specific biblical mandates or what we would call commands. Several of the points I'm going to share this morning come from my quiet time Bible that Jamie Work gave me back in 1983. It's a Zonderman Harper Study Bible, and I've got several comments or several points that came from my study Bible. Let's pray. Lord, I need you. Lord, we need you. And thank you that today we can meet together in fellowship, Koinonia that we can celebrate Molly and her baptism and her family loving and serving you for decades. And this being the natural, supernatural result of her family loving Jesus, she loves Jesus. And we thank you for that. And we thank you that we can celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper together. And we thank you that we can study your word together after we've worshiped together. Lord, we thank you that we can do life together. And your word will guide us in the lives we live, individually and as families and a congregation. God, thank you for your presence by the Holy Spirit here. Holy Spirit, help me. Help my mind, my mouth, to think and speak that which brings glory to you and guidance to us. I need you, and I surrender to you. Oh, God. I do not take this privilege, this honor, lightly I'm thankful help me Jesus in your name I pray amen 
The Word gives us principles for Christian conduct, general principles for Christian conduct. The Christian is to live life in a way that commands respect of others. The Christian is to live life in a way that commands the respect of others. If you have your Bibles and you want to go to 1 Thessalonians 4.11, 1 Thessalonians 4, it's toward the back of the New Testament. As we look at some principles the Bible gives us for Christian conduct, let's look at this first principle. We are to live our lives in, in a way that commands Christians, I mean, commands respect of others. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. If you got it, say got it. Thank you. Make it your ambition. Verse 11, 1 Thessalonians 4. Make it your ambition, your desire, your goal to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands or your head, just as we told you, verse 12, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, those who don't know Christ, who are not in the church, so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Now, I'm going to give you a short running commentary on these two verses. So it's going to be, by the way, much more practical than theological. I, I'm not really a great theologian. I'm more of a pragmatist. So let's look at this together. Commands respect of others. That's what the Bible teaches us. Lead a quiet life. Now, that's really self-explanatory. Lead a quiet life. Basically, you and I should never be the topic of discussion in our neighborhood. Especially, we should never be the topic of discussion in our neighborhood because last night we took our 12-gauge turkey shotgun and blasted our neighbor's barking dog and left the corpse on their neighbor on the porch. That would not be the proper way to have a quiet life in your neighborhood. It, 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 most of the time, the Bible is not rocket science. It's God puts it on the lower level for those of us like me who don't, are not, I'm not really always capable of getting to the top shelf. Right here it is. You know what a quiet life is? Getting along with people. Getting along with people. That's a great start at living a quiet life. Don't, don't be rough. Smile. Greet people with kindness. Be tender. Lead a quiet life. Here, got to move on. Mind your own business. Okay. Mind your own business. Preach. <laughs> I hear you. Thank you, sister. I hear you. Let's just say that out loud together. Here we go. One, two, three. Mind your own business. Now, what that doesn't mean, I need to interject what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean live a life locked up behind your doors and your privacy fence and your gated community, and I'm not against any of those. All of us in life and country need to have borders and boundaries. Anybody that doesn't want any kind of border, then take all the locks off your doors. But you love. You love. And where they allow, you're involved. Be kind and helpful, but not noisy and intrusive. Don't be a gossip or a busybody. That doesn't help the cause of Christ or advance the kingdom. Mind your own business. Be involved where they let you, as often as they let you. Two phrases in those two verses go together. First phrase, work with your hands. And the second phrase, that's in 11 and 12. The second phrase, not be dependent on anybody. Those phrases go together all there. They're in two, uh, two verses. Paul is telling the Christians, and I don't know what was happening there. I didn't do a lot of background study, but evidently a lot of this Paul's addressing situations that were happening at the church at Thessalonica. And he, and he says this, you need to be gainfully employed. Paul's saying, it's good for you to have a job. Now, there are times that you and I, we find ourselves without work, and we do support, help, and encourage one another in those tough times. 
But for the most part, Paul's saying most of the time, unless there's a disability involved, people who can work should work and provide for themselves and their family. Matter of fact, Paul says if a man who's capable of working doesn't work, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't eat. That's in the Bible. No, we'll not all have the same job or make the same income, but the Bible clearly teaches that we are to work hard and for the most part take care of our own families. This means getting the right job, working hard, balancing our own budget with our finances, limiting our purchases inside of our means, and being good stewards with all that God gives us. Then occasionally when we hit a, a downtime in the economy or we, our job gets phased out, we need help from one another, we gladly help one another in those off times. And by the way, work started back with Adam and Eve and in the garden. If you didn't know that, Work's been around a long time. Work is not a four-letter word, a bad word anyway. Some people think that work started when sin entered the world. That's not true either. Work started prior to sin in the world. The first instructions that I remember about work is when God told Adam and Eve, tend this garden. Take care of this garden. God is teaching us it's good to have something that, that you do. Employment, a job. We lead a quiet life. We mind our own business. We work with our hands. Then we command respect of those around us. The Christian is to live a life that is fully pleasing to God. Fully pleasing to God. Colossians 1.10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every work, growing in good, every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Now, how can you and I be fully pleasing to God, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, helping others know, grow in Christ, helping others know Christ and grow in Christ? That's the relationship that Julie, our VBS drama director, and works with our children and Molly and all those team of high school and college kids. They're working together, growing in Christ. That's good works. That's bearing fruit. In the next service, we'll have three who are baptized. That's bearing fruit because you as a family of faith and our staff partner together and minister in our community. Helping others grow in Christ. Know Christ and grow in Him. That's pleasing to God. Fruit bearing is making a difference, having a positive impact, spreading the gospel, helping children and teens and adults grow in Christ. That's pleasing to God. The Christian life is to be lived in a way that we are in the Spirit. In the Spirit is the next sub-point. Galatians 5.25. Galatians 5.25. So I say, live in the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. King James Version says, I say this then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This verse is a great principle for Christian living. Walk in the Spirit by means of the Spirit. The word walk is peripateo in the Greek. It means to walk up and down. It comes from a Greek philosophy where the instructor, the leader, the teacher would teach, and while he taught, he walked. That's exactly what peripateo means in the Greek. It was a school of philosophy in Athens, Greece. And the principle for us is walking in the Spirit. If we do, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And by the way, when you hear the word lust in the English, L-U-S-T, most often your mind immediately goes to things that are sensuous or are sexual by nature. That's not what this Greek word means. This Greek word does not mean that. Lust of the flesh refers to the desires of the flesh. And by the way, the, the word flesh in the New Testament is sarx in the Greek. And that does not need, it, do, it doesn't necessarily mean sexual. It doesn't necessarily mean bad. It just means natural. So this, many things that this is talking about are not immoral. But like things of the flesh, like an, an appreciation for music or art, that's great. But that is a desire of the flesh. And we may simply enjoy them, and that's very cool. There are many things which in themselves are not evil, but they can take the place of spiritual things. And let me continue here. Some Christians get wrapped up in a hobby which takes them away from the Word of God. Many Christians spend a lot of time worshiping before that used to be a little screen in a box, and now it fills the whole wall, that flat screen. 
Now, I, I watch TV. Don't misunderstand me. There's nothing inherently uh, uh, sinful with cable or video or Netflix or TV or whatever you have. That's amoral. It can be used good or bad, same way the Internet. You, that which can destroy lives with pornography can save lives with the gospel going to the ends of the earth. It's amoral. How are you going to use it? Uh, you, I'll be the first in line next Saturday to watch UT beat Georgia State because we got to get one year win this year right off the bat. We got a stretch against Georgia, Alabama, and Florida where we're going to bowl 0 for 3. You got to get a win or two early. And I'll be there the whole time screaming and celebrating when we beat a second tier team. But you know what? If I spend three hours watching Netflix or you spend three hours watching Netflix every day and you don't take 30 minutes for the Word of God, your sarks, your flesh is not where it ought to be. And I, there's nothing wrong with TV. It's amoral. TV ought not to rear your kids. But I said that correctly. I asked Sterling. You rear children, you raise chickens. Look it up, Grammar. And I didn't mean grammar, grandma. I mean grammar as in English. How much time do you and I give to the things of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the advancement of God's kingdom versus the things that we enjoy? Guys, if you've got a hobby and you're taking in your garage and you're rebuilding that beautiful 67 Fastback Mustang that you're going to give to Pastor Tom on his 58th birthday, <laughs> praise God. Do that three hours a night, but make sure you give 45 minutes to Jesus in the Word. Then I can receive it gladly. <laughs> That's walking by the Spirit. The Christian life is to be lived in a way that worthy of your calling. Ephesians 4 1, worthy of your calling. Paul says this to another church, not the Thessalonican, the church at the left, that church with. T-H-E-S-S Thessalonica but the church at Ephesus he says this Ephesians 4 1 as a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called King James Version the word beseech or beg is the same word that we find in Romans in another Paul, I think, Paul, another book Paul wrote in the first chapter of the first verse of chapter 12 of Romans. It is not the command of Sinai with fire and thunder. It is a gentle wooing of love. I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, I encourage you. I, I love you. Let's do this together. It's the right thing. Worthy of your calling. To walk worthy. That means live a life equal to the position that you have in Christ. You have a high position as a child, a son or a daughter of Christ. Don't live a low life here. Live the right life here on the level of Christ. Worthy. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, Philippians 1.27 says. Paul begs us to walk worthy of the gospel. People probably would never tell you to your face, but let me, let me say this, and let me present this to all of us, that people around us in our neighborhood, at our workplace, they very well may be evaluating whether you're the real deal or not. They, they may not have an old legal pad like some of us still use, sometimes 11, 11 inches tall, sometimes it's 14 and they might not be keeping score. He said this, she said this. They lost their, they lost their temper. They screamed or they sent a bad email or they got on Facebook and turned loose. They may not be doing that on a piece of paper or on the notes on their phone, but sometimes in their mind they're saying they claim to be a Christ follower. They go down to TSC, Thompson Station Church, but I'm kind of watching to see how they live at the restaurant, how they treat the servers, at the ball game, how they treat the umpires. You know that, let me, let me tell you, when I say that right there, and I point my finger out there, I got three point back at me. I'm not, I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching at me. If you listen, that's fine. How about when you go, go to Nashville, 
on the way to work on 65 and you're in that traffic and somebody cuts you off and how you respond to that? I got to behave because I don't know that, that y'all not sitting right out there when I holler and blow the horn and shake my fist at you. <laughs> not many people use gospel tracks anymore. You ought to. Eternal life. It, God's power still works in all kinds of ways through all kinds of means. My mom... I rarely ever, Sterling, my mother, I, I rarely went to a meal with my mom where she didn't leave a gospel track for the server. But long before my mom ever got to the end of that meal and paid for that dinner and left this track, she was laying the groundwork by looking at the server in his or her eye and treating this with kindness and respect and being appreciative and not complaining and not fussing and then at the end leaving a generous tip and then leaving a track if you're going to leave a track don't give a 3% tip after you've been fussing the whole time uh, that don't help be generous and leave that you see that that's walking in the spirit that's living a life worthy I challenge all of you I challenge myself let's live lives worthy of the calling Somebody's watching. Second thought. The Word gives commands for Christian conduct. And we're going to have to move quickly through this. The Word gives commands for Christian conduct. And the first, we're commanded, and th these are just things that I, I think that all of us deal with on a regular basis, but I wanted to hit some highlights. Obviously, I can't hit everything. But uh, forgive those who hurt you. I think one of the things that robs most Christians of joy is, is that we've got unforgiveness in our heart and a root of bitterness grows up and then that just shuts us down spiritually. Forgive those who hurt you. Colossians 3.13 Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then Matthew 18.21 Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and then I forgive him up to seven times and Jesus said to him I, I do not say to you seven times but seventy times seven Matthew 6 14 says if you forgive those who sin against you your heavenly father will forgive you but Matthew 6 15 remember this if you don't forgive those who forgive you if you refuse to forgive others your father will not forgive your sins I mean it's plain you and I don't get the privilege or the opportunity to be unforgiving. And you say, well, you don't know what he or she did. Doesn't matter. It's hard to think that anybody in this room have had anything done more cruel, violent, and unjust than what they did to the Lord Jesus on the cross. And when they're nailing him with those spikes on that wood, on that cross beam, Jesus said what? Father, forgive them. That's our example. I was reading about forgiveness, and uh, I don't know if you still remember because it was last year in January, in the January of 2018, there was a doctor named Larry Nasser, N A S S A R, and he was the United States of America gymnastics national team doctor and a physician at Michigan State for more than two decades. He was a child molester. For over 20 years, he had abused hundreds of girls, and he will now just, uh, justly spend the rest of his life in prison. Let me tell you something more important about that story than Larry Nasser. He's where he should be. Rachel Denhollander, D-E-N-H-O-L-L-A-I-A-N-D-E-R, Google her. She was the first victim to speak out. And at Nasser's hearing in January of 2018, listen to her. She made this remarkable statement to her abuser, Dr. Nasser, and I quote, Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing, and that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet, because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found, and it will be there for you. She added, and I quote, I pray... This is Rachel Denhollander. I pray to Dr. Nasser, her abuser. 
I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of your guilt so that you may someday experience the true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. My God, that's powerful. My God, that's powerful. That is absolutely mind-boggling powerful, and you can only do that when you walk in the Spirit. It moves me right now. That Rachel could make such a courageous and Christ-centered statement to her abuser who abused her over and over and over at track meet, gymnastic meet, gymnastic meet, gymnastic meet. In the horrific way he abused those girls. She chose to forgive. Friends, we choose to forgive. As a Christian, you, you, you are commanded to control your anger. I'm commanded to control my anger. Ephesians 4, another letter I mentioned a while ago to the church at Ephesus, verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are angry. Do not grieve, give the devil a foothold. Leanne and I made a commitment as soon as we were married that we would never lay our head on a pillow and go to sleep mad at each other. And you say, well, y'all have just a perfect marriage. No, we've been up many a night till 2.30 in the morning. That's what that means. You just work at it. You just hold hands. And then you just pray. And then you ask the Lord to forgive you in a prayer and ask your spouse to forgive you in a prayer. Tell you what, when you hold hands and pray to a holy God, it's hard to be mad at your spouse. It's hard not to forgive when you realize how much you've been forgiven. And we need to control our anger. Doesn't, doesn't say, by the way, don't ever be angry. There are things in this world you and I need to be angry at. We need to be angry that precious Precious children in the womb of a mother never get to see the light of day because our nation has downplayed the sanctity of human life. We ought to be angry about that. Righteous anger. We ought to be angry that your family members and mine and my nephew die of drug overdoses because drugs are so rampant and we're not able to help people who have addictions as well as we ought. We ought to be angry at that and sin not. We ought to be angry that even in our own state, there are precious girls, almost preteen, that are stolen away and, and, and put into sex slave. We ought to be angry. We ought to do something about it, but not sin in it. Because even the vilest of criminals like Dr. Nasser or someone who would buy a young girl, trade her away for money, They, they need the forgiveness of God just like I do. And I, oh, but the grace of God, there go I. So it is not ours to be judge and jury. Not ours to close the book on who can and who can't be born again. Who can and who can't be forgiven. If God can forgive me, he can forgive anybody. And so when we are angry, let's make sure it's a righteous anger, not a selfish anger. And never let it get the best of us. You don't think Jesus was angry when we went in the house of God and they were buying and selling, selling deformed pigeons to people who travel long ways and cheating people out of money. He was angry when he used the cat of nine tails and knocked over the tables of the money changers. He was angry. But he didn't sin. Last thought. Live at peace with all men. Live at peace with all men. Romans 12, 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. You leave that up to God. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Do your best to get along. There are some people that just don't want to get along. Do all that you can do. Do your best, but you can't change them. And if they refuse 
just stay out of their way. Extend the olive branch. And then if they refuse, if you pass them per chance, be kind, smile, say hello, speak, and move on with your life. Friends, I don't know who was it that told me a long time ago, but it's true. Just because there's a skunk in the sidewalk doesn't mean you have to kick it. I don't know, that's, that's Dixon talk, but it sounds all right to me. I mean, if somebody wants to be a skunk, you don't have to let them spew all over you every time you see them. Be nice, but sometimes you take a wider step. What is truth? The Word. We've been talking about the Word. What is truth? Denzel Washington switches to Trump, shocks Hollywood. That headline was in November of 2016, saying the famous actor was supporting Donald Trump for president primarily because, and here's a quote attributed to Denzel Washington, he's hired more employees, more people than anyone I know in the world. The story was fake. Not a word of it was true, but that didn't keep it from going viral. Numerous outlets covered it. Fake news in the news. Here's some other examples of fake news. Donald Trump won the popular vote. He did not. The Clinton Foundation bought $137 million worth of illegal arms and ammunition. That was in the news. Did not. FBI agent associated with Hillary Clinton fake uh, email leaks found dead in murder-suicide. Did not happen. Here's one. Here's one that was in fake news. The Pope endorsed Donald Trump. Did not happen. Here's one. The Pope endorsed Bernie Sanders. That didn't happen either. All these are in the news. None of these are true. But they were so popular, they were picked up by news feed, even including Facebook and Google. Gave them more credibility. Have you, are, you, are you familiar with the term post-truth, P-O-S-T, truth? In 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries declared this term to be their word of the year, post-truth. According to their definition, post-truth is an adjective relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less, listen, objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotional and personal belief. It's like saying, if I believe it's true, that makes it true. <laughs> I am a bird. I can fly. I can fly. I'm jumping off the top of this building. I can fly. No, you can't. Gravity works. <laughs> but that's the world we live in. Editors noted the use of the term post-truth increased 2,000% between 2015-2016. These are challenging days for truth, T-R-U-T-H. For decades, we've been told that truth is personal and subjective. The argument runs like this. Our minds interpret our senses, resulting in knowledge. But no two people sense the world or interpret their senses in precisely the same way. As a result, there can be no such thing as absolute truth. There's only your truth and my truth, according to the popular thoughts. If, quote, appeals to emotion and personal belief, end quote, persuade you, that's your truth. Such appeals may be post-truth with regard to objective truth claims, but who are we to judge? Many in our culture are convinced of this post-truth approach to the world. The consequences cross the spectrum of moral issues from abortion to same-sex marriage, same -sex marriage to euthanasia. And, and the statement is, you have no right to judge me. That's the mantra of the day. Of course, listen to this, friends. Of course, to claim that there is no absolute truth is to make an absolute truth claim. Such subjectivism makes moral judgments impossible. Subjectivism makes moral judgments impossible. If all, listen, listen, let's be ludicrous, but this is where it's going. If all truth is subjective and relative, the Holocaust could be Hitler's truth. 9-11 could be Al-Qaeda's truth. Don't let the post-truth culture deceive you. All truth is still God's truth. Neither human nor divine nature change, making the Bible as true and authoritative today as when the Spirit first inspired its words. 
our post-truth society may decide the Bible is wrong on moral issues, but they are wrong if they so decide. The Word is truth, always will be truth, always has been truth. Not a jot and tittle will be removed. The grass fades and the flower, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word, the Word of God abides forever. God's Word is an anvil, and we don't break its commandments. We break ourselves on them. I don't get to decide. You don't get to decide. And the world doesn't get to decide what truth is. And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He is truth, and His Word is truth. Now and forever. Amen. And amen.